Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this teaching on foreclosure. My name is Dennis Bernstein, and I work at a station called KPFA Pacifica Radio. And we're very proud that that's non corporate, non commercial people's radio, and we want it to stay that way. So, everybody in this room, when you leave here, some time in the next 48 hours, please contact 10 people and uh, ask them if they subscribed yet to KPFA Pacifica Radio. And those watching on the stream, I want you to uh, come to the rescue of your people's alternative radio network. I first came to this story of uh, corporate banking corruption and uh, the attack on everyday people. When I started covering the SNL scandal, you remember that? Yeah. The SNL savings and loans. Remember, we used to have savings and loans that were truly our Jimmy Stewart community banks. You remember, we could actually go get support, uh, crucial support for the work we wanted to do or the places we wanted to live. And we knew that we would find a warmth and a, a, at least a chance at a welcome and an opportunity. And then, with great fanfare, Ronald Reagan, with the help of plenty of Democrats, deregulated the SNLs and turned them in to corp cash cows for corporate raiders. And we saw the demise of the SNLs. I, some of you may know, I did a deck called SNL Scandal Trading Cards. I was amazed. The Wall Street Journal gave it half of their, the cover of their second section. They thought it was beautiful, but they just liked the pictures, apparently. Nice visuals gets you some uh, head, headway space. Nevertheless, I kept, when I started covering the SNL bailout, I kept hearing, ah, me, I'm the kind of guy, I'd buy the New York Times and throw the business section in the garbage, read the, read the front section in the sports, I admit it, and sometimes books. But who would read the business section? But I had to start reading the business section, and I kept hearing this phrase around the days of SNL. It's the largest movement it would be, they were saying, these experts, the largest movement of wealth upwards, percentage-wise, in the history of the modern economy. I didn't quite understand what that meant. But to break it down in a nutshell, it meant that these corporate bank raiders that took over these SNLs and use them for every kind of scandalous activity. And do not forget that the CIA also used these SNLs once they were deregulated to uh, funnel money into illegal covert operations. And so our beautiful banks, our SNL, our community banks, went down. And the what is the, the movement of the wealth? Well, they, had, they spent all our money, and in order to keep the FDIC and government institutions whole, the taxpayers had to bail out, pay for that bank bailout. Thus, the money of all of us goes whoosh. So what happened? Fast forward, bank bailout. The corporate go-go bankers devised all kinds of schemes. Oh, they said, all you communities of color, you want loans? We'll give you loans. We've got this new thing called subprime. Nah, meet me at McDonald's. We'll sign a paper. You don't have to read the 15 pages that you wouldn't understand anyway. And it'll all be good. Refinance. Thus came all this go-go banking. By the way, I have to say this, and I have to remind people as this election 
comes up. One of the key architects of subprime lending and, pack straight, uh, and packaging these subprime loans to be sold, to be sold on Wall Street to places like Merrill Lynch, one of the key players was a woman by the name of Penny Pritzker, who is the reason why Barack Obama got elected. Let me say this again, and it's to this day true that Barack Obama's key fundraiser is an architect, was an architect of the subprime securitization marketing on Wall Street operation. That was after she crashed, or while she was crashing a bank in Chicago, what was that called, Superior? I think it was called Superior uh, Bank, and uh, where about 1,700 depositors lost everything. I want to remind you, she's the reason why Barack Obama got elected. So, I, I do appreciate the song about Bush and Cheney, but the struggle is now. So here we go again. You're going to meet C.J. Holmes, real estate broker, advocate for the people in one moment. And C.J. Holmes is going to explain how this, this uh, operation that first cost the people their people's banks, then caused the extraordinary bailout of the banks, and it's about to go into the third stage where all these foreclosed on houses turn into hedge funds. I wouldn't be surprised. No, I don't know. But I can't imagine that Penny Pritzker is not going to be engaged in the hedge funds because her family, the Pritzker family, has always been 30 years ahead of the pack. They were doing leverage buyouts in the 40s. Remember, she owns high regency. Anyway, we have a lot to learn tonight. We want this to be an empowerment teaching. We want the people who are here and the people who are watching us stream and the people who hear about that and the people who see CJ wherever they see her. We want people to get active. You're here to help yourselves, to help your friends to pass on the word and to fight back against this foreclosure pandemic. I'm Dennis Bernstein, and let me bring up now C.J. Holmes. Uh, let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Dennis, and I really, really appreciate this opportunity to have people that are willing to come out late at night and listen to some kind of presentation and then maybe do something about it. I'm, my hats are off to you. It's this kind of commitment and volunteering, because I'm just volunteering. I do this all on my own. And the fact is, if we don't do that, then we have no one to blame but ourselves when we lose our country. This is a massive fraud. And before I go into the presentation, I want to say three things. One is, my name is C.J. Holmes. I'm a real estate broker. I'm an independent. I do not list foreclosures. Not that I haven't tried, because that's where the business is. The people that list foreclosures are getting filthy rich. Everybody else is dying in this industry. The, I'm a longtime investor. I came to the industry with the idea that if a smart broker did the transaction, the client, the owner, property owner, would make more money. I proved that long ago. That's absolutely true. It really does make a difference who you hire to represent you in your real estate transaction, whether you're buying or selling. But the third thing is, I'm, I, I know this stuff. So I'm going to be whipping along. And please, if you don't understand a term or a concept, if you just raise your hand and then you know, I'll, I'll repeat in a new phrase because I, I don't want to lose you just because I'm whipping out terms right and left that, that some probably understand, but some may not. All right? I set up a website, OccupyOurHomes.info, in last September, October. But in June 2009, 
if you go to the page on my website called Stealing Our Homes, you will discover at the very bottom is a little video I put together. Because in 2009, after one year of foreclosures, I saw the handwriting on the wall. And I, I can predict the future because I count the numbers, you know, and I'm pretty much aware of what buyers and sellers do and how the industry works. And I was saying in that little 10 minute video, hey, hey, we gotta stop this. Stop these foreclosures, they're gonna ruin our property values. So tonight, we're gonna do four topics. The first is how they've ruined our values. The second is the 12 steps of bank fraud. And you're gonna know by the time we're done that it's not your fault, it's not my fault, it is completely at the fault of the fraudsters. And if they, they are scared to death, I swear, they don't think we're smart enough and they don't think we're united enough. And that's why they're gonna hurry up and foreclose as fast as possible. They're gonna ramp up foreclosures because they get paid when they foreclose. They don't get paid on a short sale, not in the same way. So you're gonna learn these things tonight and understand what's really happening. And then we're gonna quickly talk about the current loan foreclosure pipeline. I cannot tell you how many people email me, call me, leave a message. Ah, uh, I just stopped making my payments. Ah, what's going to happen? So I'm going to go through the timeline and you'll be able to understand real quickly. It's just one little chart and you can take that chart. I'm going to load this presentation up on my website when we're done. So you can go to the website after tonight. You can print this out and then you can actually have this little chart and run around to all your family and friends and say, oh gee, let's see, you haven't paid for three months? Ah, no sweat. <laughs> okay? And then we're going to talk about fighting back. We as a group have to fight back and each individual has something that you can do to help this cause, help us fight back. Because like I said, if we don't, they're going to foreclose the other 30 million loans that they have in MERS, which I'll explain, it's, the, it's their little database. And that means 60% of the loans in this country will have been foreclosed. That will mean all those people kicked out of their houses, all those people can't get a loan to buy a house for three years, because that's the rule. So all of this country is going to turn into a significant renter nation so that the hedge funds can buy the foreclosures by the millions at pennies on the dollar. And then they'll rent them to you. And then they're going to put them in big pools and they're going to securitize them and they're going to just do this whole thing all over again. The first thing we're talking about is how this crisis has hurt us. This is a quick chart and I'm going to whip through these. But basically in 09, they talked about Certain areas are double trouble. And I've, of course, circled Northern California and you'll see the red dots in Southern California. These are where both foreclosures are rampant and jobs have disappeared. So we're in double trouble. When you think about the fact that construction jobs virtually are gone, because houses are selling now at less than $100 a square foot, and it costs 200 to build. So how many permits do you think we're gonna have? We have a few, I'm shocked. But not enough to keep, uh, not enough to keep that industry alive. Every big construction company, every builder has gone bankrupt. This is a chart of a bunch of numbers, and you can look at it more closely for your county. I apologize, I know we've got some from Fresno County, and I don't have Fresno on it. I have, don't have SAC, but I can count those numbers. And the fact of the matter is, these are the 11 counties, nine in the primary Bay Area, and then Mendocino and Lake. They like to include themselves. And you will notice, at the start of 2008, that was not even the peak of our values. At the start of 2008, to the end of 2011, 
the significant drop in values. Over a third of the value is gone in almost every county. So people will say, oh, well, Solano was really bad, and San Francisco didn't really get hurt. And I say, well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Those people are feeling it, too. They're just, you know, at another zero at the end of the, of the number. It, it really doesn't matter. Every property is on a slide. Whether you're up here and you don't, you're not falling off the end yet, then it may be easy to sort of overlook it, ignore it. But in general, this is what the counties are doing. And you have to understand that Berkeley is not as bad as Oakland, okay? There's all these ups and downs and different results, but everything has come down. This is the pipeline of current foreclosures. This was done in 2011. At this point, there's still over six million in the pipeline. 30 day, 60, 90 day default, and then there's this big gap of waiting until a notice of default is filed, and then you're technically really in foreclosure. They're gonna take the house back in 111 days in this state. This chart, does not talk about the 11 million homes whose loans are upside down. The loan is far more than the house is worth. Nor does it predict how many more loans are gonna be upside down by the time they get through selling these and taking these back and dumping them on the market. Here's just a quick count I went through each county and I counted how many they have for total number of housing units, these are homes, and how many are underwater or upside down. And you'll note, as you look at your county, some are worse than others, but the total number of 342,000 is far more than the 250,000 loans that were supposed to be helped with the bank settlement. By the way, as a really quick aside about the settlement, they haven't written it yet. They have agreed in principle, whatever that means, and most of the monies are gonna to go to Southern California. You look at how much goes to LA or how much is supposed to go to Riverside, very little is going to come up here. Oh, and it was only those five banks. So if your loan isn't with them, count you out. It's not really a settlement, it's basically a cave-in. The fact is they're pre they've calculated that because the foreclosures mark to market every property. So you take your house, and if you have a house, let's say that you paid 400,000 for it, and the house next door just sold for 250, your house, if it's just like it, you know, comparable, is now worth only 250. 50. It doesn't matter how much you have against it, it just means you're forced into being upside down. And when you're upside down, you can't refinance, you can't sell it except short, you can't get any kind of loan mod because those are pretty much a scam and a sham, unfortunately. I mean, a few people do, and then they tell me what kind of a mod they got, <laughs> which was basically all the extra payments stuck at the back end, no principal reduction, you know, they dropped the point for three, four years. It, it's just, they're, they're a scam and a sham. They really are. Now, this is what I want to explain. This is an example. This is called middle class wealth destruction. There are hundreds of thousands of people in this boat. Some of them contact me. It's a heartbreak. It's every one of the people in so many of our homes and counties because this area, you know, 600,000, 650, that's not a very big number for a lot of counties. However, this is what happened. So in 2009, they paid 650 and they took their cash out of savings, out of their 401ks, out of their stock accounts. They took real money and got a conventional loan. They were being really smart. So they put their money down, they got a loan, and they're able to pay it. However, now, only two years later, that house is only worth 325. 
they can't refinance. Their loans were at 6%, they can't get four. Mm -hmm. Nobody will talk to them. They don't even know if they should make loan, the payments anymore. This is what is leading to, as we'll talk about, strategic default, where people make the decision that companies make like that. They go, ah, property is upside down, we'll just dump it. And they stop their payments and move on. And it's, it's amazing, the American Mortgage Association did that on their $40 million building. They just walked. So, so literally, the, for the last year and a half, my husband and I look at each other and say, are we chumps? We're paying our mortgage. Why are we doing that? Big question. It's a big question facing everyone right now. And the trouble, real problem is, you and me, look at your age, look around. You're my age. We're in the 40 to 80 bracket. We're the ones, <laughs> I'm being kind. <laughs> We're, but I'm telling you, th there aren't any college students here that I can see. Those people don't own homes. They didn't build this country. They didn't put their money into housing thinking it was a good bet. They didn't keep paying their bills even if it had to come out of their savings because they felt they had to do that. And so when we're faced, when you and I are faced with this, we're speechless. We, we don't know what to do. And so we're going to discuss that too. One thing I want to quickly mention is lots of people miss this. They understand supply and demand, they think, because they think of houses. They don't think of buyers. It's two sides. It's a teeter-totter. You got houses and you got buyers. So if you have a few houses and a lot of buyers, the price goes up. But if you have a lot of houses and a few buyers, the prices go down. So the question becomes, they have about the same number of houses listed, how come the price keeps falling? And it's because of this, locked out buyers. The banks make a rule, and now we're talking about the lending arm. We're gonna give you a loan, but oh, shame, shame. You had a short sale or foreclosure, no loans for you. So, now think about this, the prime loans that I just talked about done in 09 and now these houses are upside down and now these middle class people like you and me have to decide okay if I don't pay then that means I can't buy with a loan for three years so if this is the count of how many people have lost their homes in each county just in the last 36 months and what I've done with the month of sales, I like to always have a reference point. Each county, each submarket too, but each county sells a certain number of homes a month in general. So I took last year's monthly sales over the whole year, I just take the volume of the year, divide by 12, and then divide it into the number of buyers that lost their home. So what you've got in each of these counties is, for example, Alameda. There's 19 months of sales, home sales, that volume that's going to happen, that's how many buyers they've locked out. 19 months worth they've locked out. So we're, real estate is a closed market. People just move around, you know. The new family starts up and they buy a cheap house, the investors look for cheap houses normally, and then they sell, and normally they have equity, and so then they take the difference and they buy something bigger, something more expensive. And that's this engine that pushes the prices up, and that's normally how real estate sales work. And then when you get to the top, you know, you're older, and you say, oh, geez, I'm gonna, you know, retire. So you sell out, you buy something inexpensive, and you net the spread. You live off the difference. That's what I call the classic retirement plan. And I don't care whether your house is worth a million dollars or ten thousand dollars. Every person that's retiring is doing the same calculation in their head. And so what's happened here is that 
you don't have any, any buyers for those upper properties. Everything that got sold was a bank sale. Everything is sold to a, you know, a first time home buyer or an investor. Well, how many first time home buyers and investors are there? How much money can actually flow into these homes? And so the banks are constantly lowering the prices, teaser, 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 because they want to sell their stuff, and it constantly pushes the values down, constantly pushing other loans underwater. Now, that's how they've, been, how they've hurt us. This is a, a series of drawings, 12 steps of bank fraud. I want to tell you that I've put this together from my research, from the articles. They're all on my website. They're linked. The Neil Garfield is an attorney that, has, that does uh, foreclosure defense workshops. And I was able to listen to one of those workshops. There's 60 minutes. There, there's lawsuits. So I'm not going to source each item that I'm talking about, but I want you to know that they're sourced. It's on my website. You can ask me later. Um, check on it. But the fact is, these 12 steps of defrauding are why we have a foreclosure crisis right now. The first one, yeah, these are the first three steps. The very first step is that in the late 1990s, a um, actually it's the um, what's it? I forgot his name. Sorry, it's the chief of staff that Obama just hired, um, Jacob Liu. He used to work for this company. This is a well-known Washington D.C. law firm, and they issued the legal opinions in the late 1990s about MERS. MERS is the Mortgage Electronic Registration System, and it's real simple. It's just a database, it's just a piece of software that they charge for access. So all the member organizations, which are the banks, there's about 3,000 members, banks and title companies and insurance companies all belong to MERS, they all pay their little dues, and every time they want to go in to the database to do something, you know, there's a little fee. That's all MERS is. But what it does is allow all of these entities to make changes to the ownership of the loans they made just by logging in. And they can do whatever they want. And there's no tracking. And there's no record keeping. I'm not kidding you. I have a whole page dedicated to MERS some lawsuits that are linked there, and a brief overview trying to make it understandable. But basically, what it was done, the reason they did this, was because they understood, these guys, these architects, understood that if we have to, every time we change these loan ownerships, because we're playing the securitization game, we're going to be shifting these ownerships around hither and yon. And if we have to go to every county recorder's offices, for every loan, every time we change this? Are you kidding me? That'd be just very expensive and time consuming. So I got an idea. Let's just make our own database. And so they did. And so that's what they're doing. So the first thing they do is they basically cheat both the recording fees and the, the public knowledge of who actually owns the loan. Turns out you can't find out. It's in MERS, and they won't tell you. Or if they tell you, it'll be one thing one month and one thing the next month. I hear this a lot. Well, you know, in my lawsuit, they said this, and then they said that, and then they said this. It's because they just make stuff up. They really do. The second thing they did in setting up this whole securities concept of where they're going to make a billion bucks, trust me, they wanted to circumvent the SEC. When you start selling securities on Wall Street, you know, and investors buy, well, the SEC sticks in their little nose and they go, well, wait a minute, what are you selling? I want to look at what you're selling. And so they said, eek, we don't want that. So they specifically went offshore, set up foreign corporations to hold these securities so the SEC wouldn't bother them. They could do whatever they want. And that's why I say they game the investor protection. So the investors 
are supposed to be knowledgeable. There are pension funds. They bought a lot of this stuff. And they basically believed it because the banks put it out there and they've been trusting the banks. Then, in this particular case, before they ever made a loan, you don't think they're going to use their money. They wanted to use the investors' money. But to get the investors to buy the securities before they made loans, you had to get some ratings. And so they gave the ratings agencies probably a lot of money, but pro forma data. And for people that don't know what pro forma means, it means made up. They literally said, okay, we're gonna make a loan and this is what the payment's gonna be and this is how, this is, you know, the payment history. They made that stuff up and got the ratings. And so basically it was a complete lie to the investors because they, they got ratings. They're AAA rated. Now step four, and this is one of the key points, they, they also insured the pools of funds. Now I'm gonna use the word securities and pools probably interchangeably. It's, it's a little, we're trying to get our, wrap our head around what exactly are they doing. So they have the MERS database, they've got that all set up and ready to use. They've got the members, you know, there's about 3,000, and they're the ones that completely control what's ever in the database. They make stuff up. Now, they decided, we're going to set up these pools, these securities. And so we're going to place a bet on these securities that their values are going to rise. So we're going to do a credit default swap as an insurance plan that if the values fall, the other guy is going to pay me off. And that's basically how a credit default swap works. However, in this case, they knew exactly that the values were going to fall because they designed every loan to fail. Then they overinsured. I've heard it said, Neil said, the attorney, they did it 30 times. So if they made a $300,000 loan, the credit default swap payoff would be $9 million. And now that does not go to the investor. It goes to the servicers. The banks signed the, they call them pooling agreements. These are the servicing agreements. And so they're placing bets on the value of the pools before there's even any money in them. Okay, so now we're going into um, five and six. This is where uh, step five, this is also crucial, and we'll come back to it in another way in step 11. But they, the fact is, since they put the loans into MERS, they decided, and it's combined with the IRS, they went to the IRS when they set up these securities and said, these are going to be very long-term investments, and so they get, should get these tax advantages, and the IRS said, okay. And so what they used them for, however, was short-term collateral. So when you do short-term stuff, you've got to buy and sell it. You've got to move the ownership back and forth. So they didn't want to assign the loans they made to the securities. They just left them in the database. And they just make changes in the database. So the fact is, the actual fact is, these loans were never assigned to the investors' securities. Now, the key with that, when we get to foreclosures, is only the owner can foreclose. Legally, only the owners can foreclose. So at this point, what they've done is defrauded the investors by lying to them about the ratings, and then defrauded them by never putting the collateral into what they bought. But the investors didn't really know or care. They were getting returns. It was great. It's only when the ship started to sink that things have started to happen. Oh, and the IRS is now checking into this long-term, short-term thing. Now, step seven, eight, and nine, this is where we live. They're cheating the borrowers. They, the, um, oh yes, the banks, the number one thing is, this is truth in lending. 
Truth in Lending Laws state that when you make a loan to a borrower, you have to identify who the lender is. So the bank said, I'm the lender. And so you've got Wells Fargo and Chase. You've got all these entities saying they're the lenders. Except they weren't. It was not their money. They were only servicing lots of money that they had sold into these securities, but they hadn't made any loans yet. So they defrauded the public by saying, I'm the lender, when actually they're not the lender. And it's very confusing because we misspeak all the time. We say it's a bank-owned house. Wrong. It's a bank-serviced house. It's not the bank's money. It never was the bank's money. The bank got paid off more ways than we want to think about, and we'll talk about that in step 12. The fact is, they are servicers only, so they, I call them pretender lenders. They're pretending, and as long as, you know, the emperor's got no clothes, it's fine as long as everybody believes it. The emperor's got no clothes here. So the second thing they did, they knowingly, criminally, breached their fiduciary responsibility in making a loan because they pushed these loans, because of the big payoffs, on people they knew could never, never pay them. When the loans reset, and we're going to talk about how that actually works. I have a little example down here in the lower right-hand corner. The example, this was what they did. This is what it meant by subprime. Uh, one of the things, there was lots of things it meant. But this is a good example, and it feeds into the next example. They make a $300,000 loan to somebody, and the teaser interest rate for two years is 6%. Interest only. So the math, do the math, it's 1500 bucks a month. And the guy is super happy because he can pay the 1500 And he's got the house. And his loan officer said, oh, no problem. The prices are going up. And so in a couple of years, we'll refinance you out. And we'll get you a new loan. And you won't have that nasty second, blah, blah, blah. So everything was fine. But think about it. The actual interest rate on the loan is like 16%. The actual payment is supposed to be $4,000 interest only. He can't pay that. And he knows he can't pay that. But he really wants the house. And it's a bidding war. And so the fact is on month 25, when the interest rate resets, that's what I'm talking about. Whenever I say a reset, it's either an interest rate or it's a negative amortized loan, I call it hit the wall, because you can pay just a little bit, not even the interest, for an X amount of time, typically to 125% of the loan value, so you could accumulate more principal. It, it gets a little complicated. The fact is it doesn't really matter. They dreamed all this crap up, because what matters is that at an identified date, on month 36, month 48, pick a number, pick a month. It would fail. They knew it would fail. That's the point. They needed that credit default swap to pay off. They want these securities to fail. It's, it's hard to imagine. So then they fraudulently, criminally pushed people in, lied to them, did everything they possibly could to get these people to refinance or to buy a house. And then, step nine, the loans I've already talked about, they've specifically designed to fail. What lender actually would do this? And I want to make just a little quick aside. This is one of the things I think each one of us and this whole country needs to push for, and that is no more securitization with our home loans. If you're going to give me a home loan, you're going to hang on to it. And you're going to be my lender, and I'm going to be able to call you and talk to you about my loan, and you're going to take payments from me. That's the arrangement. No more gambling, no more gaming the system. And I'm afraid if we don't push for that, we cannot put the banks back in the box. We cannot get control of them. They are, they are way too smart and clever and have all these attorneys to figure this stuff out. Yes? Can you define securitization? 
Securitization. It's the process of pooling a bunch, in this case, a bunch of loans into a, secure, in a, into a pool, and then they go to Wall Street and sell little fractions of it to everybody. They, they have permission from, um, that's, that's the way that works when they take, when they securitize anything. And in this case, they're securitizing mortgages, our loans, our payment stream. They're selling little pieces of it, exactly. Well, that was if they were actually selling it. Really, what they were using these MBSs for, mortgage-backed securities, or collateralized debt obligations, whatever you want to call them, whatever you're comfortable with, they actually were using them as short-term collateral for large cash deposits. Turns out FDIC has a rule of 250000 That's the maximum they'll pay off. And so sovereign wealth funds, very rich people, have way more than 250,000, and they don't want 1,000 accounts. And so they made arrangements with these bankers. It's called the shadow banking system, where they can put these deposits you know, in a in bank, and that bank will secure them with these MBSs. That's why they're playing the short-term game, because then the, you know, the wealth fund would say, well, I want my money back. And so they would take some money out. Oh, oh, now you got to shift the loan ownership around. So they log in the MERS. Now, here's the false foreclosure documents. This goes back to the fact that they never assigned the loans to the securities. And so the issue becomes, who owns the note? <laughs> Nobody. Oops. Well, we can't foreclose without some kind of ownership. So they start to figure out how we're going to make that happen. I have a, uh, an article on my site, it's called The Remix Have Failed, and I'm sh gonna show you a little clip. It's a fabulous short little article that talks exactly about what it looks like to have a fraudulent assignment. You'll note on this assignment of mortgage, up at the top, well, you can't read it really well, but the fund, the securities, closed in 2006. And according to the actual rules of how they wrote these securities up, the documents, after the fund closed, you can't do any more documents. You can get the investors that bought that security to sign off on changes, but you're not supposed to do any changes afterwards. So what do we have here? Well, you'll see down in the, um, in the middle where it says Mortgage Electronic Registration System. Well, that was dated 2009. So three years later, they decide that they're going to assign that note to that securities. And, uh, but it's under MERS, and MERS is just a database. It's not even a member. And so the whole thing makes absolutely no sense. Oh, and then they notarize this. Uh, like four, three or four months later. Now, you'll love this. This is, comes out of, I have on my homepage a little video about 60 minutes and it's about robo-signing and it's about Linda Green, poor Linda Green. <laughs> this is what they did. They hired people at 10 bucks an hour and they gave them a stamp and they were paid by the page. And so they would have to take these stamps and stamp these documents and so, you know, no, numerous people sign the name Linda Green that were not Linda Green and stamp them with all these different stamps. And in fact, in some cases, they would take different stamps from different people belonging to different entities and stamp these documents so they could get them filed in the foreclosure. And they would file these notice of defaults and foreclosure filing paperwork at our county recorder's offices. Thus is the audit that was done in San Francisco and just announced this last week. They did an audit. I don't know what they paid. I've heard about 30,000. They had 382 mortgages for, um, foreclosures audited for the paperwork, like we saw in this, um, like that. They looked at all the paperwork that was filed and they figured out 
that 99% of them were questionable and 85% were probably illegal. Definitely fraudulent. So, so what? What does that mean? And that's, that's where we, you and I, and, and us as a country have to actually sit down, stand up and say, okay, what does that actually mean and what am I going to demand? Because I know this, I've heard it more than once, if we had a million people standing up in the streets screaming for their heads, we would get satisfaction. It's the political will. This is why the attorney generals are caving. There's no or really well-organized effort. Occupy Wall Street has just been a flash fire and people are angry about a zillion things and they're all good causes. But this, in this particular case in real estate, the middle class, the people that own the homes, must stand up and must demand they stop playing with our homes and that they give us our houses back. How that's going to be, we have to sort of mull that over and think about it. There's some options. Okay, the last step. S sorry, yes. She's talking about isn't Cal isn't California law require you to record every title change? Sure. So, of course, of course. And this is this is why in the audit they came up as fraudulent. But the problem is here's the problem. This problem is so massive. I mean, we're talking like millions of loans and millions of foreclosures that have already happened. I, I swear, mainstream media and, and the powers that be really don't want to hear it. Okay? This, and, and we can expect articles to come out to say, oh, this, they were just reckless. They were just careless. The fact is, if you and I did what they did, we'd be in prison. No questions about it. And if they say, well, it was just, you know, complicated. <laughs> well, if you're going to own property, then you better do it right. So, step 12, let me finish. Cheating the taxpayers. The point was, and I've already mentioned, the credit default swaps. Think AIG. And you've got to understand that when the Federal Reserve Geithner went into the A and discussed with AIG, Goldman Sachs was there. You have to understand, it really helps to really get a grip in your head that the Federal Reserve and Goldman Sachs are a revolving door. It's one and the same. And so until we, at some point, it would be nice to either get rid of the Federal Reserve maybe have one in each state, that's one of the banking, uh, state banking concepts that's coming out. Um, you can read about some of that on my website, under helpful links, public banks. But the fact is, this is very high up. Eric Holder is refusing to look into these audits. He's saying, I already appointed Schneiderman, who is the Attorney General of New York, so let him do his thing and then I'll look at it. But Eric worked for these same guys. They represented all the banks and MERS. You don't think he's going to step up and do something? I mean, and that's the problem we have. It's them and then all the rest of us. And even if you and I, you know, aren't going to occupy any houses illegally, still, we have so much to lose. The loan pipeline. I want to quickly go through the loan foreclosure pipeline because everybody says, what, what about me? What happens if I stop paying? And this is how it currently works. If you default on the loan, and there's several reasons that people default, sometimes their loan exploded, like we talked about. Sometimes they lost income, who hasn't, just about. And sometimes they decide to just walk. Whatever the reason, once you start a default, in 30 days they'll ding your credit. 
It's over. You got a credit thing. So 60 to 90 days, they'll just be hounding you. Hounding. And they may, that hounding may go on. You may get calls every day. You will get stuff mailed to you. You will get people calling you. They will tell you anything that they th think that will c convince you to make a partial payment, some payment, talk to a loan counselor, try for a loan mod. Because every time you apply for a loan mod, they get paid a thousand bucks. And Obama wants to raise that to 3,000. So we know which side he's on, unfortunately. And the fact is, he has already stated, we have articles on the website. In uh, January 9th, he, an article came out from CNBC that Obama wants to sell hundreds of thousands of Fannie and Freddie foreclosures to the hedge funds. It's no secret, guys. This is the plan. So are we going to let them do it or step up? So after you've defaulted, it's unknowable how long it may be, but the next step in this is a notice of default in California. You, quickly, there's two different kinds of foreclosure states. One is like California, deeds of trust. You don't go to a court, you don't see a judge, you don't get to say nothing. They just file the notice, tell you when it's going to the steps to sell, and sell it. A, for, a judicial foreclosure state is where you have to go to court and the banks have to go to court and, and put the documents in there and that those states are where they really got in trouble with all the robo signing because they actually lied to all these judges. They took docs in there and they said, oh yes judge, it's all true, but, you know, absolutely, everything is hunky-dory and we just know everything is right and then they discovered that everything was wrong. And of course that's like a hand slap rather than like throwing these guys in prison. Once there is, in this, so in this state, once there's a notice of default filed, the day counts. The, you have 90 days. You count 90 days, and then they have to advertise the auction for 20 days, and then the next day, the 21st day, they can sell it at the steps. Yes? Can we discuss that later? Okay. <laughs> All right. I didn't quite hear the question. The, the fact is, once the notice of default is filed, the, and that's the first time an auction date is scheduled. And I subscribe to special software that tells me when these dates are supposed to be. Not that it's totally perfect, but it's pretty accurate. The only time that I usually will miss something is if it's a private investor who's filing a notice of default and he's not going to be selling it through Recon Trust at the auctions, at the courthouse steps. So anything that's filed with the major companies that, by the way, are wholly owned by the banks. And the, the reason the servicers did this and set up these foreclosure companies was because they wanted to make sure that you know, multiple investors didn't try to foreclose on the same property at the same time. They're, they're screwing around with the ownership, so we want to just keep it, you know, really correct and straight in line. And so here's the funnel, everything goes in. So they took all that business away from attorneys. They set up their own. So the fact is, once the auction date hits, usually the bank slaps some, some worker for the bank, slaps the notice on the door of the house so that if there's a tenant there, they often go, what? I've been paying my rent and now this house is going to foreclosure. Well, you know, kiss security deposit to buy and the owner has been skimming the rents. Is it legal? Absolutely not. It's done all the time and a lot of people do it intentionally. I recommend and offer anybody that's going to rent, just call me with an address, just email the address. I can tell you in five seconds if it's scheduled for foreclosure. And a lot of times, the people owners don't even know. They either never did get notice on the door. Oh, oops, is that legal? No. So what are you gonna do about it? 
or they're in the middle of a loan mod, and the servicer will tell them, oh, just ignore that stuff. There's no foreclosure happening on your house. We'll work on a loan mod. Yeah. Un until the house is sold to some investor, and they're told to get out in three days. This is happening all the time, all over. A thousand homes a day in California are facing foreclosure auction right now. They have 32,000 homes a month scheduled for auction in California. Now, the basic strategies and all we've got to work with are right here. You've, a loan mod, if it can delay and postpone, but often the person is dealing directly with a servicer and has nobody in the middle to tell them what's happening. Often, I am the one that will tell the agents, I'll tell the banks, because the bank department has no access to this information on these properties that they're servicing. So they don't even know if the foreclosure got postponed or not. And sometimes this runs into the very day of auction. Talk about stress on the homeowner. They don't even know if they're going to have a house or not. And we're right in the middle of a short sale or something. Short sales are probably the most effective solution to at least allowing owners to have a time frame of move out, but about 40 to 50 percent of them fail. The bank's valuation expert goes out and says it's worth, you know, twice what it's worth, and so you can't sell it, you can't get the price, and so they foreclose. Gotcha. And then bankruptcy. A lot of people will, you know, have been told, well, if you file bankruptcy, it postpones foreclosure. Well, yes and no. What it does is stops the actual auction, but once you're done with bankruptcy, they can proceed. So it's not a real solution. It depends on your loans, and if you have a, a big second, for example, a first and a second, and the house value has dropped enough that the second is no longer supported by the value, then that can, the bankruptcy judge can wipe that off. Just tell that second lender, I'm sorry, you get nothing. It's over. But still, most people can't pay the first. Or the loan has fallen so much they don't want to pay the first. There's all kinds of problems with it. So the answer is, when people email me, or, ah, what, help me, I quickly look to see when the auction date is. No auction date? Well, you know, we'll check next month. <laughs> There's really nothing that I can do. They can try for a loan mod, they can try a short sale, but there's no real urgency. It's when they are going to be sold at auction in the next two weeks, that, and that's usually when they call, and it's really agonizing because bank servicers have these rules, which are if, it's, if you do not have a qualified offer, complete offer with a complete package, which is completely a joke, but nevertheless they require it, within 10 or 14 days prior to auction, too late. We're just gonna take it back. And that's because they wanna take it back. Now, fighting back. Let's get to what, what are we faced with and what can we do? It seems very overwhelming. It's a humongous problem. It helps to understand what the banks are planning. And what the banks are planning is very obvious. They want immunity. They don't want to have to mess with that stuff anymore. They want to foreclose as fast as possible so that they can get out of this mess and get as much money out of it as possible. They want to hide any kind of problems with that process so that the hedge funds can step in and play a new game of ownership and securitization. So, what we need to do are a, a, a bunch of things, and literally this changes almost every week. Now that San Francisco stepped up with an audit, there's a real push by people I'm connected with to have every county do an audit. The trouble is it's expensive, and it takes time. And again, they're only doing, like in San Francisco, they only did 16% of the foreclosures. There were 2,405, and they only did 382. And of course, you extrapolate. But the fact is, they get a lot of money. It takes time. The public is still sitting every day. A 1,000 people are losing their houses. 
And so, you know, the, the idea is maybe just use the threat of an audit <laughs> to get the Attorney General to make some changes, to get the legislature to make some changes. We're still brainstorming. There's an Occupy the Recorder's Offices movement. They're talking about March 9. 12. 12. Okay, see, things change. <laughs> they do. <laughs> because, you know, more ideas, more thought. You know, oh, that isn't going to work. This will work better. And that's another reason why when I get to the individual things, you, you need to get connected so you can keep up to date. Because this is a, this is a moving target and we're a moving group. It's a moving, um, which is plus. We're moving in the right direction and at least we're here. That's such a fabulous start.